Therapeutics Initiatives Method Speaker Series, and I'm pleased to, uh, pre uh, to present to you today, Dr. Harlan Campbell, and he's with the University of British Columbia Department of Statistics. And today he's gonna to be talking about uh, the difficulties in determining the lethality of COVID-19 and the various ways in which Bayesian methods can help. So thank you, Harlan, for talking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. All right, let's get started. Um, just to introduce myself, uh, like Carol said, uh, my name is Harlan Campbell. I'm a postdoc here at UBC. Uh, I work with uh, Dr. Paul Gustafson in the Department of Statistics. And uh, recently we've been working on uh, some COVID statistics. Uh, this is a paper we have in progress. It, I should also mention that it's not just the two of us. There's a whole group here um, that come from all over the place. Um, it's a collaborative group uh, that originally came together to work on, uh, well, some of us came together to work on Zika virus methods and now, uh, and now this. Um, so, oh, let me. next slide. Uh, so the question at hand here is a rather simple one. If someone is infected with SARS-CoV-2, how likely is that person to die of COVID-19? So it's a relatively simple question. And the answer is, we answer this question uh, by looking to the infection fatality rate, which is a very simple ratio of the number of deaths over uh, the number of infections, the number of cases. Um, what I want to get across in this uh, presentation today is that it's a simple question, but it's very difficult to answer. And that's because the data used to determine the answer uh, has many different sources of uncertainty. Uh, and what I'm gonna try and convince you today is that Bayesian methods are particularly useful in this case because they are very good for handling many different sources of uncertainty and propagating that uncertainty uh, to get a good answer. Um, and we'll see two examples of that uh, to deal with unknown diagnostic test accuracy uh, and to deal with an unknown degree of preferential testing. So let's go back in time a bit to the start of the pandemic and we'll see, you know, it seems like a long time ago, uh, but let's start February 29th, 2020. Seems like ages ago. Um, but this is when things were starting to get underway when you had the first uh, death in the United States, the first person uh, in Seattle believed to have died of COVID-19. Um, and a week later, about March 8th, this is when you first started to get uh, epidemiologists trying to estimate the infection fatality rate. So here's a paper, uh, March 8th, and they're using data from, if you recall, the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which had a wonderful sample of people, unfortunately, trapped on board, uh, and many of them got infected. Uh, it made for uh, some good data. And here you see they're using that data, and they get an IFR estimate, which they say is somewhere between 0.2% and 1.2%. Uh, so that is what, one in 5,000 to 12 in 100. Is that correct? One in 500 to 12 in 1,000. Um, this is, at the time, we have to remember that um, <laughs> this is the, if we were, does anyone remember these charts that were very popular at the time? Um, March 18th, there was only uh, 115 deaths total in the United States. There was more than 3,000 at the time. That had happened, unfortunately, in Italy. Um, but the, the data, there wasn't very much data uh, on which we could estimate the lethality. Um, a month later, we were in a different situation. There was about 2,200 people dying every day in the United States. But we still, as the New York Times here reports, April 18th, we still don't know the true death rate for COVID-19. And it's an elusive question, they say, for epidemiologists. And they do a very good job here of explaining uh, why that might be. Uh, they say here, I'll just read a bit. We know how many people are dying, but we don't know how many people are infected. 
the number of the missing data on deaths is one thing, but uh, the, the expected increase in the denominator, the number of cases, the total number of infections um, is the real issue. Um, so the issue, uh, let's go back to slide. Pardon me. Um, the, the issue epidemiologists call it severity bias is that uh, the people who are getting tested for COVID are more likely to have COVID to begin with, right? Uh, severity bias. People who have symptoms uh, go get tested and therefore it's not a representative sample. What we need is a representative sample uh, like that cruise ship, for example. So you see a couple weeks later, there's huge efforts to get some representative samples. Um, and these are called seroprevalence studies or antibody studies. Uh, in just the first week of May, you saw at least five different groups come out with papers where they tested uh, an attempt at a random sample of people in a community uh, for antibodies to see, uh, to gain some idea of the infection rate in that community. So you had uh, the Santa Clara study, which is now a little bit infamous, is controversial. Um, and you had studies in Iran, in Japan, Idaho, Geneva. Um, we're fast forwarding a couple weeks later. Um, we have this review by Ioannidis. He has done some research, looked through all the available seroprevalence studies. And he's made a list, he's found 12 that have a sample size of at least 500. So it didn't take long to get these, these antibody seroprevalence studies out there. Um, here's a table from his, his uh, review. And I picked this table um, for a couple of reasons, because uh, first of all, well, you can see all the different locations where people are doing these studies. Um, and you can see the sample size and in specifically in this paper, he's trying to uh, use this data to infer what the infection fatality rate might be, right? And you can see just in this table, how there might be some issues with that kind of inference. Um, the sample size, for example, here is being extrapolated to the population in the greater region. And you might suspect it, it might be difficult or implausible or maybe just challenging to take a sample of say 500 people and extrapolate it to more than 2 million people. Is this sample really representative of the population at large? And then uh, the second thing that comes up here is this antibody column. It's telling you what kind of antibody test was used. And this is where there was also quite a bit of problems when it comes to the inference. And we'll, we'll get to that. This is mainly uh, summarized in a great paper here by Andrew Gelman and Bob Carpenter. And this is our first example of how Bayesian methods come to the rescue. So let's, um, let's look at some data. This happens to be the numbers from that, that uh, controversial Santa Clara study, but um, we could have chosen any numbers here. It's just an example. Uh, so in that Santa Clara study, uh, they tested 3,330 people. And out of those people, 50 got, had positive tests. And you might think, well, this is excellent. The statistics should be fairly easy. It's an it's a easy ratio here. We can estimate the infection rate to be 0 0.015. Uh, if you assume that it's a binomial ratio, uh, you can easily calculate a 95% confidence interval for that. But of course, this would be a mistake because, and you probably saw this coming, um, the, this ratio is really not a good estimate of the infection rate. It's just the positivity amongst those tested. It's, and the tests themselves are not 100% accurate. We have to adjust for sensitivity and specificity. How accurate are the tests? Uh, how many false positives and how many false negatives are they gonna give us? So there's an easy formula for that. Infection rate is equal to positivity plus specificity minus one over sensitivity plus, okay, so we can calculate that. And we can get a nice confidence interval that's now adjusted for uh, 
the imprecision in the tests. Now, uh, this still though is not good enough because the, here's the thing, the sensitivity and specificity also have uncertainty amongst them. Uh, we don't really know what these numbers are. Uh, we had, let's go back to the last slide. We had a uh, uh, specificity of 0.995 and sensitivity of 0 0.844, but those were really just guesses based on some data. If you look to the study, they, they had this data here, 103 uh, confirmed negative cases out of 122 and 399 confirmed positive cases out of 401. So uh, there's uncertainty in these numbers. You can put uncertainty intervals around them and that uncertainty should be contributing to the uncertainty in our overall uh, uncertainty interval for the infection rate. Um, so this is where um, we can do some nice, simple Bayesian statistics, right? We have three different ratios. We're gonna say that they're binomial distributions. We have a formula for the infection rate. Uh, we can sample from these distributions, we can put uh, some very simple uniform priors on the unknowns. We have our likelihood as binomial, and then we can sample from the posterior. All right, well, the idea is um, we can easily sample from the posterior here because uh, we've defined priors, we've defined likelihood. And in that way, the uncertainty in all of our unknowns will uh, be accounted for in our estimate for the infection rate which if we were able to run that little piece of R code, we would get a credible interval from 0 0.001, so that's basically zero, uh, to 0 0.19. So that's quite a bit wider than we had when uh, we weren't properly accounting for the uncertainty. Um, and we could say this, you can say that this uncertainty interval is about equivalent to a binomial distribution with three confirmed cases amongst 350 tests. What does that statement mean? It means that suppose we did have a perfect test, 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity, uh, it, and we obtained this uh, credible interval, it would be about the same, it would, it's equivalent to had we gone out and tested 350 people and got three confirmed cases. So that's, that's the, amount of data that we've really been able to get. Um, let's move on. We could uh, go a little bit further with our Bayesian model here. If we wanted to use the infection rate to get an estimate of how many cases there are in the community, well, that's not too problematic either. We could um, just say that the number of cases probably follows a binomial distribution. Uh, where the denominator is the population size and the numerator is the infection rate. And we're getting uh, good information about the infection rate from the previous elements of the model, right? And then we can even go a step further if we had the number of deaths in the community. Well, now we have the number of deaths and we have good information on the number of cases. Uh, so we could then, this is how we could get uh, samples from the posterior, we could get an estimate of the infection fatality rate. Uh, and that's gonna take into account all the uncertainty right to the end. Harlan, do you mind just stopping and answering some questions so people can understand as you go along? Sure, I haven't been paying attention to the chat, so they'll have to. Yeah, so one question is, um, what does it mean sampling from the posterior? So that's one. And then the second one is that how did you get that figure three of confirmed cases among 350 tested? Okay, um, the first question, uh, what do we mean by sampling from the posterior? Um, is that uh, in a Bayesian model, we set up, uh, we define prior distributions for the unknown. So in this case, for example, the infection rate is unknown, but we're going to say a priori, it could be anything from zero all the way to one. It's equally likely. And we're going to get, we're gonna repeat this a million times, say, uh, draw samples from this distribution. And for each sample, we're going to see how 
likely is that sample given the data? How that's that's where the likelihood comes in, right? Uh, you, we have some data here, are the numbers, and we picked a uh, a value for the infection rate from the prior, and then we test it to see how likely is it using the likelihood. And if it's very likely, uh, we'll consider that in our estimate. And if it's not very likely, then we then we will put it aside. And if we repeat this exercise, which is called sampling from the posterior, uh, say a million times or five million times, uh, we will get a nice set of numbers that are plausible for the infection rate. And using those numbers, we can then uh, just take a look at them. And how did we get these numbers here? Three out of 350. Um, so, Let's imagine that you were going to calculate a regular uh, confidence interval from a uh, binomial proportion. And so you get some data for the numerator and the denominator. And after you calculate that confidence, the confidence interval that you get from that data is 0 0.001 to 0 0.019. What are numbers for that numerator and denominator that correspond to such an uncertainty interval? So you can just do a little bit of math to figure out that it's about three out of 350. So in other words, if you had no uh, uncertainty and uh, no problems with the test accuracy, uh, you would only need to see three out of 350 tests that are positive to get this type of result. Well, uh, yeah, let's carry on. You can see here that, um, Right, the um, just doing a straight up binomial confidence interval uh, gave us that original uh, estimate here from uh, 0 0.011 to 0 0.02. If you adjust for specificity and sensitivity, you get a wider uh, confidence interval, but that's not taking into account that these numbers 0 0.995 and 0 0.844 are also. Uh, come with some uncertainty. And as I said, this is uh, in a great paper here, Gelman and Carpenter. Let's go back to that list of seroprevalence studies. Uh, we also, we had concerns about anti the, 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 the properly accounting for the, uh, the testing accuracy. But we also had concerns about whether or not the uh, samples were representative of the population at large. And it doesn't take you long to figure out that this might be a serious problem. And I know uh, the Santa Clara study authors got into a lot of trouble about this because of the way they recruited their uh, sample. Uh, it might not have been the best way to do it, but they were not alone in having problems. Let's look at, for example, the French study here. How did they get these 661 individuals? And can you generalize that to the entire province of, of uh, I think it's the Hone? Um, well, what happened here, when you look at their paper, they describe it, there was some cases identified in a high school. So they were concerned, they did some contact tracing, and then they got the recruited volunteers from that high school and their parents. Well, that is certainly not an, a random sample that you can generalize to several million others. Uh, and I mean, <laughs> We don't want to just pick on that one study or even that one and the Santa Clara study. Uh, there's a lovely uh, effort here by a group, a lot of these are Canadians, um, that have looked over the landscape of seroprevalence studies. They've got over 300 uh, up until August. And <laughs> reading through all these hundreds of seroprevalence studies, they have a wonderful website as well if you want to check it out. It's serotracker.com. But the the main takeaway for me was when they assessed each of the studies for bias, uh, this is the result. You can see the overall risk of bias here. Um, most, I would say this is a healthy majority of studies have a high risk of bias. But what really got me was uh, item number eight, appropriate analysis. Uh, you see that most of them are in the no category. And if you, you can read what item eight actually says on there, on their survey, it says, does the study correct for population characteristics or is the sample somewhat representative of the population at large? Do they test uh, correct for test characteristics? 
Uh, and so for the, you know, so a lot of seroprevalence studies uh, suffer from these issues. That's all we're gonna say, but not all of them. There are some uh, studies that went to great lengths uh, to get a representative sample. And one of them is uh, the small town of Germany, Gangov. Um, that uh, had an unfortunately timed carnival. And so there was a high rate of COVID and researchers went into the town and they did a very good job of getting a uh, random or as close to random sample uh, tested for antibodies. Um, so they get a uh, very reasonable, oh, pardon me, infection rate estimate uh, from 12% all the way to 24% is their uncertainty. Uh, we can do that same thing and see what that's equivalent to in just a strict ratio, 27 confirmed cases out of 153 tests. Um, now, suppose you wanted to use this data to infer the infection fatality rate. Well, we could do that. We saw how we could do that. Uh, we have... Uh, some information here about what the infection rate is. It goes from, it could be anywhere from 12 to 24. Uh, we have an estimate of the population. I don't have the exact number, but we have an estimate of the population. Um, and we have the number of deaths. There were seven deaths recorded for the town. Uh, simple Bayesian model here, three binomials. Uh, we can infer what the infection fatality rate is. So you have your confirmed cases given uh, the infection rate and the number of tests. The infection rate can then be generalized to the population at large to get a number, an, uh, an estimate for the number of cases. Using the number of cases and the number of deaths, we can then infer what the infection fatality rate is. So there's uh, uncertainty that is at th for three different binomials that we should be accounting for. Um, it's actually, oh, there's the population. There it comes, 12,000 people. Um, we would get uh, infection fatality rate estimate of 0 0.37 with a credible interval that goes from 15 to 73. Um, I said three binomials, just a note for those paying attention, you could simplify this to two binomials um, by doing some simple math, but that's all right. Um, we're not the only ones to try and do this exercise. There was a paper, Nature Communications, where they in, tried to infer the infection fatality rate from that small town. Let's see what they find. Do they find an infection fatality rate of 0 0.36, 2945? So you might think to yourself, well, wait a minute. That is quite a bit different than what we found. This is what they found, 0.36. And what we found was, using our simple Bayesian approach was 0.37. The, the point estimate is not that different. That could be a rounding thing, but the interval is quite a bit narrower. And so you might wonder why did they get such a small interval. Uh, and the answer is quite just simple, is that they did not take into account the multiple sources of uncertainty. Whereas, we, whereas there's uncertainty for several binomials, as we saw in the model, they only, if you look at the methods, compute the uncertainty for one binomial distribution. Um, we're not the only ones to, to, to find this error. There's a lovely um, group of Germans here, if you go to this website, that break down the whole uh, Bayesian analysis of this paper and come up with the, the same numbers we do, of course. Um, this goes to show that it's, <laughs> Not only do the Bayesian methods allow you to account for the different sources of uncertainty, they really force you to think about the different sources of uncertainty that sometimes are neglected. Okay, so we're gonna keep going. There's um, another study that was done similarly in Geneva. Uh, they collected a bunch of data at trying to get a representative sample of the general population. Um, and they get an estimate from 8% to about 14%. And once again, we can just do our simple three binomials here uh, with the number of deaths and a population of about half a million people. This would correspond to an infection fatality rate of 
0.45. Um, the math is pretty simple. Luxembourg had another uh, attempt at recruiting a so-called representative sample from the Luxembourgish population. And we can do the same math again here, right? And we can get an infection fatality rate. We looked over the literature at the time, this was uh, in late May, June, and we found five studies that claimed to have uh, recruited a representative sample. So here's another one from Croatia. And for each of these five studies, you can calculate an infection fatality rate estimate with a 95% credible interval quite easily. Uh, and the fifth one, let's see, it was from Zurich in Switzerland. Now, so, and we get a, a, a point estimate of 0.81. Uh, so the next question, of course, is, well, we've got all these different small little studies. They each give us a little bit of information. What if we could combine the evidence across the studies? And, and this might remind you of, say, a meta-analysis, right? So instead of uh, three binomials. Let's do three binomials for each K. In this case, K goes from one to five, right? And so now we have an infection fatality rate for each group, for each population. And just like you do in a meta-analysis, you might put a, a normal distribution. You might say that the infection fatality rate varies across populations, but there's an overall mean. And here G is just a link function. So uh, so that it has a, a, a more or less a normal distribution. You could do a logit or a log link. We do a C log log link in our paper. Um, and you could do the same thing for the infection rate. So the model doesn't get much more complicated. We have a couple more parameters here. The theta, the tau, the beta, and the sigma. But we can put reasonable priors on there. We're going to put uniform priors and half normal priors. And we've got the likelihood, and we've got five groups now. And we can now sample, and we have the, the data. Let's not forget about the data. Here's the data. The data are very simple. That's just 20 different numbers. Uh, the priors, the likelihood, the data, we can sample from the posterior and get an overall estimate of the infection fatality rate. So here is. Uh, the red dots are corresponding to the estimates for the infection rate in each of the five populations with the credible intervals. And on this panel, they're corresponding to the infection fatality rate. And here we have the overall estimate, and it's about 0.55 here. And you see that the uncertainty interval is quite narrow. So that's excellent. Is there any more? This might be a good time for questions. If there are any more questions. Yeah, so there was just one question. Um, uh, one person asked, is the R code public? So um, we can go through it ourselves later. Uh, and definitely I will make the R code public. It's, uh, it's surprisingly simple. And if my computer and the internet was a little bit faster, we would have already gone through it ourselves right now. Uh, obtaining these numbers can happen within seconds. Um, but I will make sure to post it. Um, any, any other questions? No, that's it for now. Okay, so let's continue on uh, very briefly and see where can we go from here? Well, what about data where the sample is decidedly not representative? Uh, we might look, for example, at some national statistics, right? Uh, in Denmark, they tested quite a few people uh, by the start of May, 266,000, and they get uh, 9,000 confirmed cases. But of course, the people being tested are not representative of the population. In other words, um, in, our, in our little simple model here, the infection rate for the general population is not the same infection rate that you see amongst the people who are getting tested. So this number and this number, this, this, breaks down a bit. We have to make a modification to the, this, um, of course, right? We can't just do that, but we can, let's, let's keep it as simple as we can. Let's say, let's introduce this new parameter phi, uh, 
when phi is equal to one, then this here is one, this becomes what? This becomes just the IR. And when phi assumes larger values, it means that the people who are being tested are more likely to be uh, infected, right? So there's a relationship between the infection rate in the population that's tested and the infection rate in the population at large. And that relationship is being dictated by one simple parameter, phi, and we're gonna put a uniform prior on phi. And this will allow us to extrapolate from the five small populations to this, you know, we're gonna, in, in the paper we go for all the countries of Europe, right? Because they're all publishing uh, COVID statistics every, every day. Uh, so it's a beautiful data set. Just to go over this again, this, these five rows correspond to seroprevalence studies. So for these five rows, we can assume that phi is equal to one, that the uh, samples are representative of the overall population. Whereas for the rest of the data, all the rest here, these are data obtained from official national statistics. And we assume that there's some preferential testing. The people who are being tested are not representative of the overall population. Um, but that's, it's as simple as that, right? We, we've, we have our three binomials again. All we've done is now introduce this little phi parameter. Uh, but now that we've got all this data and we, and we could fit this model, but before we do, we've got a whole lot more data now. We can be a little more um, thoughtful of how the infection fatality rate and the infection rate in each country relates to one another. Instead of just putting a normal uh, theta tau squared, we could introduce some covariates in the model, right? We could put a, like, this might remind you of a regression model, put in some factors, some variables that might be predictive of the infection rate and might be predictive of the infection fatality rate. So for example, what did we find for the Infection fatality rate, uh, we've got some data on the proportion of the population that is 70 years or older in each of the, pop in each of the groups. And we also uh, might think that the hospital bed capacity in each country might correlate to the infection fatality rate. So we're gonna put those Zs in. And for infection rate, we've got some predictors that we think might be useful to reduce the uncertainty. Uh, we're gonna look at population density, places that are, have higher population density. It makes sense that there's more people infected. Um, the number of days since the outbreak, we have to remember that this is early on in the pandemic. So not all countries were at the same uh, point in their pandemics. And then uh, we also included as a covariate here, the days between the start of the pandemic and the imposition of uh, social distancing and lockdown measures in that country. So this data that was relatively easy to find for all the different countries. Uh, we assemble it all together and we run uh, our simple Bayesian model. And here we go, we get estimates, country specific estimates for the, infect, uh, for the infection rate for each country and corresponding credible intervals. Those are the green points and the green horizontal lines. And we also get country specific infection and fatality rates, IFRs, and corresponding credible intervals for each of the countries. And you can see that uh, some countries have it much worse than others. For example, uh, Denmark seems to have uh, a much higher infection fatality rate. And overall, uh, our estimate is still about 0.5. We can also get from our model uh, some estimates of how those covariates, the proportion of people above 70, the number of hospital beds, uh, population density, how those uh, variables, how they are associated with the infection rate and uh, IFR. If they're correlated, we can get um, estimates and credible intervals for those estimates. And finally, we can also get estimates for that phi variable. Remember the phi variable corresponded to which, uh, to the degree of preferential testing. So how uh, targeted was the testing? 
if a country had uh, restricted the testing to only people with symptoms, you would expect a large number for phi versus if testing was freely available to the public uh, and widely available, you would expect a low value of phi. And we get estimates of phi and just as a sanity check, we plotted the numbers of phi that we get on the x-axis here uh, to something called the H2 index, which, um, which was a metric of uh, testing availability uh, for Europe that was published. And you see that there's somewhat of a, a correlation there. So we think our model is doing something sensible. I think that we're gonna end it here. Um, so let's keep just, to finish it off, uh, by July 4th, now we're well into the pandemic, over half a million are dead worldwide. And yet, and maybe you have a better appreciation for this now, uh, it's still difficult to determine how deadly the virus is um, because of all those different sources of uncertainty, right? Um, a few weeks later, what is it, July 21st, we are apparently closer to getting an answer. Uh, so that is, that is good news. Um, it says here, oh, we missed it back. Uh, research suggests the new coronavirus kills about five to 10 people for every thousand. That's about what we saw there in our numbers. Um, Though the rate varies based on age and access to healthcare, that is reasonable. Um, to conclude, we just want to say that the infection fatality rate, it's a ratio of two numbers and both of them are difficult to estimate. We were focusing mostly on the, all the sources of uncertainty that go into the number of cases, but there's also sources of uncertainty that go into the number of deaths, right? Each country reports a number of deaths, but doesn't do that in the same way. And the cause of death could be inconsistent or inaccurate or measured differently. Um, there was a very sensible idea to look at excess deaths instead of just COVID deaths. Uh, the Economist at the time had a good uh, summary of that data. Uh, just, and that's just because the, the, the number of deaths was really unreliable. So there's a whole other source of uncertainty that we didn't even discuss today and we're not taking that into account. Another model limitation is um, right censoring. Some individuals that we counted in the population or we counted as cases, uh, they might very well go on to die, but at the time that we took the data, they were not dead yet, right? We have to, there's a, there's a lag between infection and death that there's, as you can imagine, quite a bit of uncertainty around the, the length of that lag time. Uh, imperfect test sensitivity specificity, we discussed that and how Bayesian methods work very well. Uh, ecological bias, we can't forget that this is observational data measured at a group level. Uh, so to make causal claims uh, is, is difficult for all, the, for all the same reasons it is in large observational data analysis. Um, and finally, we make an assumption that the infection rate is independent of the infection fatality rate. And we, I think when you look at certain countries or certain uh, even cities, I'm thinking of New York City, for example, when it was really overwhelmed, when it had a very high infection rate, a lot of people that were infected weren't getting the care they needed. And that of course was raising the fatality rate. So to think that the infection rate is independent of the fatality rate, I think is, a, is, is probably quite improbable as an assumption. So there's another source of uncertainty, the correlation between these two that you have to take into account. Um, we've come a long ways though. This is probably the best estimate out there. This comes from the Spanish uh, a great Spanish research team. Uh, they did antibody studies extensively across the country uh, on lots of representative samples, adjusting for all sorts of covariates. And they get a 
estimate for the IFR. Oops, let, let's see what they got for Spain of um, 0 0.83 when they look at deaths confirmed with COVID-19 and 1.07 when they look at excess deaths. 0 0.83, if you go back to our model, how does that compare that what we saw for Spain? We, we were closer to the one mark, but we have a very wide comp credible interval. Um, and then uh, finally, this is the final slide, I think, September 28th. So it took us this long uh, and it took more than a million people to die, but we finally, the World Health Organization finally comes out and says there's a consensus that the IFR is about 0.6%. Uh, so I think that the question is, is fairly settled now, but it's unfortunate that it takes this long to get an answer. And with that, I will thank you. And if you have any more interest in this subject, we can go to the paper. The preprint is on the archive. Thank you so much. If there's any questions, I'd love to take them. Great, thanks, Harlan. I should. I, did I miss this? But do you, did you have any data for Canada? No. the The uh, analysis that we did in this paper was uh, strictly for European countries, and we chose to restrict it to European countries because we wanted uh, to reduce the heterogeneity in some respect. Um, and and we we're just trying to. This is really you shouldn't put too much weight in our in our results. This is just an example of how one could do an analysis um, using uh, both the seroprevalence study data and national statistics. Uh, if you wanted to do this for Canada or for other places, um, you know, there's, like we said, there's model limitations and there's different things once you should take into account. Great. Somebody said, uh, great talk. I could see these methods being wildly applicable for those classically trained. Um, and ask, what is a good resource for Bayesian stats? Uh, <laughs> what is a good resource? There are plenty out there. I can't think of something to recommend off the top of my head. Um, sorry. <laughs> There's a little um, big, it shouldn't be tough to find though. Okay, great. Um, uh, uh, somebody asked, do you dare to try running through the R code again? See if uh, your computer speeds up? Uh, I would happily do that. Uh, as long as we have no other questions, I can uh, thank everyone who's not interested in doing that and we can, we can try. Okay, so somebody asked again, um, how would you do the analysis for Canada per province? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. There has been uh, some antibody tests that have been done in Canada in different communities. Uh, so we would the first thing to do is to go and uh, find that literature, find that data, see if that data is in fact, uh, it, the sampling in those studies was representative. Cool of the population at large. Um, use that data to infer the infection fatality rate. And then what we, we would simply do is, uh, you know, the, each province is pretty good at publishing uh, the daily number of confirmed cases and the daily number of tests administered and also the daily number of deaths. Uh, it's as simple as collecting that data and, uh, and fitting it all together. Um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not all that complicated. Okay, great. So uh, we have definitely a few more questions now. So somebody asks, um, how can we receive your R code? Um, that's a question I'll bounce back to you, Carol. Is there a good place I could put it to you? Otherwise I can put it on my own website. Um, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you could do it either way, like you could, um, we could put it on our website where we're going to have your recording, or we can actually add the link to your website too, if you'd prefer that. Excellent, we'll do both. Can you maybe type uh, your website into the chat now and then everybody will at least have it, then go to your website if, if, uh, if uh, 
And then um, we have some more questions. I think one question is, um, have you informed health authorities about your findings and how do you think that may or may not influence their restrictions? Um, so my only discussion with health authorities has surprisingly been with uh, the UK government, which uh, somehow got in touch uh, about exactly that. They were looking to do localized lockdowns and uh, to determine whether a local, uh, uh, a specific region should be locked down, they wanted to have better estimates of what the infection rates were in those regions. Uh, and of course, you can't just look at confirmed cases because of the issue of preferential testing. Um, so we had a couple meetings to see, you know, to discuss if you could run a Bayesian model. Unfortunately, I think the whole idea of localized lockdowns, this was a few months ago in, but now in the UK, it seems like it's just one giant lockdown across the whole country. So uh, due to the new variant and for other reasons as well. Um, so I think that was wishful thinking. Um, but that's, that's the only, um, advice I've given specifically. Great, well, that's awesome. It, yeah, hopefully that happens with BC too, that they reach out maybe. So there's another question. Um, if I can ask another question uh, before the R code, could limitation five be addressed by including a parameter in the model that tracks hospital bed occupancy? Uh, definitely, as you can see, uh, all the limitations could really be addressed if you wanted uh, to just think about uh, how to uh, model them in a simple way, add a few more parameters, put priors, maybe informative priors on those parameters. Um, you, you know, the, the model we present is, a, is this, the, base, the base version, the simplest version. You could definitely supplement it to take into account other uh, sources of uncertainty. And there, there are uh, papers, I just read one, uh, O'Drizdel, I think is the first author, uh, that does look at um, exactly what you described. They added a couple of parameters to, to do that correlation and they fit it in, they've got a, a Bayesian set up as well. It's very nice. Great. Um, so we have another question. If you were to talk to health authorities in BC, would you recommend any differences in restrictions based on your findings? That is above my pay grade. I, or outside of my expertise, unfortunately, I, I can't really feel comfortable. The only thing I can say is that um, the, the S, when, when reading the literature, uh, that tries to characterize the, the disease, there seems to be a lot, estimates are often more precise than they, they ought to be, right? And you saw that in the, not just the Santa Clara study and uh, the following work, but you saw that in the, the German study that the confidence intervals are narrow when they should actually be quite wide. Right, even our credible intervals that we give from our model, there's all those other sources, those model limitations, <laughs> those are only going to serve to widen the credible interval even more. Uh, so we think we know things that we don't actually know. Great. Um, so somebody says this research is very important. There's a huge impact on mental health due to the current lockdowns. I'm hearing many stories from friends and colleagues. And then another person asked, uh, thoughts on addressing um, IFR for new variants, example, UK, South Africa? I, that's an excellent question. I'm, I'm, I think that's really where the important next steps are. I have not taken a look at data on new variants. I suspect that there's quite a lot of challenges there because uh, very few people are being tested for the new dip variant. Um, that being said, I did read something the other day from Denmark. This seemed rather interesting. I, I, yeah, but I, I can't say much more than that, unfortunately. 
we have uh, one more question to just uh just for you I'm, I'm not sure wh what you think of it but how about addressing uh infection um fatality rate for vitamin d deficiency uh that is just like we put in uh different covariates in the model um we had hospital bed capacity for example uh, you could certainly put in a covariate like that to see if you can uh, find any association uh, between infection fatality rates and vitamin D. I have heard in the press that kind of thing. Uh, we're, we're looking to do an analysis uh, for cardiovascular, currently right now as a follow-up paper, um, an analysis where we're looking at cardiovascular risk because there's good data on that to see if there's... Uh, by including variables for cardiovascular risk to see if there's an association between um, increased cardiovascular disease, a risk of cardiovascular disease and increased fatality from COVID. Um, but you know, these are all, you could, you could look at any number of covariates, any number of variables. Great. I think that's the last question. So yeah, I just really want to thank you. It was a really, really fascinating presentation. Well, thank you again, and thanks. Uh, it was fun.